Becky, tensions are rising between the world's two largest economies, Washington and Beijing, are sparring over the origin of the coronavirus outbreak and how uh, it was handled. And President Trump has threatened tariffs, and there's been renewed back and forth uh, over the South China Sea. Joining us to talk about all this, Peter Navarro, assistant to the president and the director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. And Peter, we're all human, as you know, and we all uh, have fears and anxieties. Do you have any fear or anxiety about the, uh, what's happening with, with some of the staffers at the White House and some, even members of the task force being um, self-isolated at, at this point? Where, where are you? Yeah, Just good, good, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good, good morning, Joe. And, and I was going to wear my shades today in honor of Andrew's new background, uh, but I decided to forgo those. No, uh, what I'm focused on um, is what I've been doing throughout this crisis is just making sure that the American people and our nurses and doctors have enough personal protective equipment and medicines at the front line. So that, that's what I'm focused on. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, what I'd love to talk to the, about today, I, I, you remember that famous day right after the election when you and I talked about uh, what was going to happen under the Trump uh, administration. The futures were way down. And what I did at that time was, was predict Dow 25,000 based on tax cuts, deregulation, the unleashing of our energy sector, and most of all, getting fair trade deals. Uh, today, uh, what I, I have a similar kind of forecast as to what's going to be going forward uh, in time. And, and what I see, Joe, if in the front lines of these supply chains, is hope and optimism, again, based on four different constructs. Sure, we're going to throw what is already close to $10 trillion in fiscal and monetary stimulus at the economy and at our jobs market, and that, that's going to be, be great for the stock market, as, as you can see now. But the, the, the structural pillars uh, going forward are going to be by American, that is bringing our supply chains and production home, deregulation to make that possible and innovation to stay ahead of the competition. And if you look at what we're doing here as this crisis unfolds, uh, this last week uh, the president signed an executive order on commercial fishing, of all things, but it is going to create tens of thousands of jobs in that industry. Two, two weeks ago, the president signed an executive order uh, aimed at making our bulk power system, our electricity grid, secure. And what that's going to involve is basically, again, buy American policies. So when we buy all the heavy equipment and transformers, it'll be made in America. But the biggest thing that's going to happen in the short run, Joe, is bringing back our, our pharmaceutical supply chains. We are moving full bore on this. And it, 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 again, it's going to be a buy American policy where, where the Veterans Administration and Department of Defense, HHS, are going to be buying American we're going to deregulate so that we can actually locate uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing here. It's very difficult to do, do that. And innovation, I think one of the reasons why the NASDAQ's outperforming the other indexes now is that the crisis we're facing now with all the structural problem it's bringing up, it's going to require tremendous innovation in order uh, to right. overcome these problems. And, and advanced manufacturing, things like continuous manufacturing, 3D printing, applied to pharmaceuticals is really going to be our pathway. So what we have, Joe, right over there is, is a jobs president, a manufacturing president, an innovation president, and an onshoring president. And the only way we're going to get out of this over the next couple of years is to bring our supply chains and our manufacturing home. So, well, let me ask so, you this, Peter, because sure. we're, we're not, we're not, uh, we're more of an island than we used to be, but no man is an island, no country is an island. We probably uh, need to keep trading with China. Some of your recent comments, and, and let's not get into, you know, whether it's a, a, from a, a P4 lab or whether it's from a wet market or whether um, it, it was uh, intentional, but one thing we do know is that there was there was not the most transparency that, that you would have liked. You've even made the case... <laughs> the master of the understatement there, Joe. <laughs> you've even made the case that, the, that there was some stocking up by China on PPE and, and that they then used it to either sell at premium prices or to actually influence countries that needed it to, to, to bend those countries to, to China's will. Sure. That doesn't sound like the kind of country that we'd want to uh, just go business as usual with... Yeah. 
with the trade agreement and with the next round of the trade agreement. Now, yeah. the president said some things on Friday. If you're in his ear, are you telling him we need tariffs, we need to punish these people, we don't go forward with the first part of this trade deal, we don't continue to negotiate the second part? Is that what you're telling him? And do you think he, so, he should take that tack? So uh, yesterday, the, the pity party, which, which was called the Sunday shows, uh, I found it astonishing that there was absolutely no mention uh, of China's role in creating uh, this pandemic. It was like the Immaculate Conception. Somehow this pandemic just descended on us. But I think it is worth saying this, Joe. Uh, this president, Donald J. Trump, built up the most beautiful and strong economy in three and a half years. And it is simply a fact that China spawned that virus. That is a fact. Uh, China hid that virus for about two months. That is a fact behind the shield of the World Trade uh, World Health Organization. Now, here's the thing, Joe. While they did that, flights out of Wuhan couldn't go to Beijing or Shanghai, but they sure as heck could go to Milan and New York, and hundreds of thousands of Chinese super spreaders seeded the entire world with what would become a pandemic. And now. This is also a fact because, Joe, it's based on China's own customs data. Right out of their website, they vacuumed, they went from a net imp, uh, exporter of PPE to a net importer. They bought over two billion masks, gloves, goggles, you name it, scooped it up from all over the world. What's my point here? Uh, they inflicted tremendous damage on the world, which is still ongoing. Tr uh, but we're, Joe, we're up to, what, close to $10 trillion we've had to appropriate in order to fight this, con uh, this, this battle. With it. So, what's, look, a bill has to come due for China. It's not a question of punishing them. It's a question of holding China account, the Chinese Communist Party account, for what it did not just to the American people, the American workers, American children, American senior citizens, but also to the but rest of the world. How do we do world. that without hurting our suspect? And, and I, I, you are getting so good at this. I, I'm wondering when you go back to Irvine to, and, and, a, and, and a student asks you a question, are you, are you going to actually answer their, their question? You know, or do you have a way of never answering you, even? Right, you've got to answer this, your, you answer this, your students' Joe. question. You know, so, what, you, you know what annoys me? I, I woke up this morning, I put on Squawk Box, and the first person you put on is Eunice. At, at the damn Disney World in Shanghai, and I come from Orange County, right? That's, that's, that's the motherland of Disneyland, and, and my American people can't go to Disneyland so what should we in Anaheim do? What should we, because should we, the Chinese we Communist forward? Party do we inflicted go, a pandemic. Do we what do, do we business do? as this usual with do. the trade deal? Do we do, should, we, should we keep the normal business as usual relationship with China with the it, trade deal, or do we need to, to really get tough and... and Cancel that. Don't do any of the future if, deals. If you, could, yeah, if you could look down at my feet here, you'd see a lane right over to my office. And in that lane is not Bob Lighthizer, Steve Manitrian, who are handling okay. the trade deal, or right. President Trump. My job is to make sure we localize our supply chain so we have what we need to defend okay. the people during the pandemic. So you do what you can. All look, right, I, I, I think, get it. I think, I think what, what this president wants to do, President Donald J. Trump, is what he's wanted to do since he ran for office, which is to bring our supply chains and our production home here. Because, okay. Joe, the only way we're going to survive and prosper, the only way we're going to have higher productivity and wages going forward is if we have a strong manufacturing base. And manufacturing, Joe, is also national security now. If anybody doesn't believe that anymore, just look at where we are with the pharmaceutical supply chain, stretched out all over the world perilously. Well, we could have made that here. Yep. So there it is. Okay. Let me. Let me. Andrew does want to ha uh, ask you a question uh, from that I bright put, background shot. Shade, shades on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Andrew, you hey, look marvelous, hey Peter. Andrew. <laughs> look. Thank you, Peter. Look, we're all rooting for you to get all the PP and supplies that we need and moving that back home. Uh, the question I had, and I think this may be the first time we've had a chance to talk since the report that you had written that memo, frankly, so smartly and ahead of it uh, in late January about the potential for a pandemic. The question, though, that it raises to me is, had we been able to get our supply chain in order, had we pushed to use the Defense Production Act and some of the other steps 
earlier, had we, had, we, had we not missed February and actually done the things you wanted to do, where would we be today? The fact, facts not in evidence are that during February, we were actually moving very rapidly uh, on a number of fronts. I was personally working on this with HHS and FEMA so that we were attacking this already. If you look at the timeline, I wrote that memo on January 29th uh, to pull the China flights down. President Trump had already made the decision, the courageous decision, to do so. But from that point, that was like the starting gun in all of this, we began from that point, and the 1st of February, 2nd of February, we began to move on, on, on different vectors of attack. Vaccine development, we were putting in place the five-company horse race so that we could get a vaccine uh, rapidly. That was key. Therapeutics, this was the remdesivir issue, plus others like what Regeneron has. And then also, particularly on the N95 face mask, we were putting in motion plans to, to actually bring that here. And if you look at, for example, the miracle of Honeywell opening factories in uh, Smithfield, Rhode Island, and the one the president visited last week uh, in Arizona, those factories were done in five weeks, Andrew. Those usually take nine months. So this whole idea of a lost February uh, is not supported by the facts and evidence. What the president and this administration were doing during that month is trying to sort out in the fog of war how serious this crisis would be without alarming the American people. But beneath the surface of those waters, we were swimming as fast as we could towards these three vectors. And so when you see remdesivir ready to go now, that was the product of work in February. When you see hope for a vaccine by the end of the year, uh, that was started in February, and when you see these N95 masks and surgical masks going, that was all started early. So I, I just reject this whole idea that, that, that we weren't doing anything because I was there. I was there. I was talking to the president. I was working with HHS, and I wasn't the only person doing that. question from Jim Cramer, who's been watching the interview, too. He says, should we declare Taiwan strategic because they make so much of our semiconductors? He says, don't <laughs> Jim, let China Jim's own it, as we seem to let happen here. over time. Yeah, well, I think <laughs> what we need to do with semiconductors as well as pharma is bring them home here. And President Trump right over there is talking with Intel and other companies to learn how to have fabs and, and foundries here, right here in the United States. This is the big epiphany for the world. If we don't learn from this crisis that the only way this great country is going to prosper is by making the stuff we need here as much as possible, then we will have learned nothing and we will sink into the abyss. With this president, we will not do that because he is the jobs president and the manufacturing president, the innovation president and the onshoring president. He's been that from the day he walked down with the beautiful First Lady Melania on that escalator and declared for his candidacy. He's been nothing but consistent about that. And, and this crisis, it's proven him right. We want to thank you, and we know we've got to run it. Uh, you know, time will tell on, on so much of this, Peter, and it's... Uh, indeed, indeed. It's I'm a not sure. now, Joe. Yeah, okay. But Thanks. you guys are looking marvelous, by the way. It's, it's, it, you're back on set, Joe, and thank Andrew, you. whatever. So have at it. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank, uh, yeah. Thanks for saying that, too.